and we have a very special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself to us? Sure, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, my name is Mike Battaglia, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Lake Charges. EV is hot. So tell me, what makes you guys special? I know that's a broad question. Like yeah, thank you. So first of all, Blink is a vertically integrated company. Mm. So we provide end-to-end -end EV charging services, hardware, software, installation. And what we mean by vertical integration is that we own and operate the equipment, we manufacture it ourselves, we design the software that runs the entire network uh, and connects all of these charging stations coast to coast, and we can provide installation services. So basically everything that has to do with uh, getting a, an EV charging station installed, we cover it in-house and we don't have to outsource it. How rare is that in this ecosystem to have that vertical integration? Uh, we are the only company in the space that actually has full vertical wow. integration. Yeah. Wow. How, how yep. did you do that? How did you accomplish this? With a lot of hard work over the last three and a half years. <laughs> how long will it take America to become a truly EV transportation nation? How are we doing? Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned Europe. So Blink is also a global organization. We operate uh, across multiple uh, countries. We have charging stations in, I believe it's 27 countries at the moment. Wow. And we have three offices in Europe. And so what that enables us to do is to kind of look ahead, if you will, to see what the EV charging industry uh, will potentially do in the United States. So for instance, uh, EV adoption in Europe is far higher than the US. Uh, public charging is ubiquitous. It's kind of all over the place. And we get to see those charging events happening uh, month in and month out, quarter over quarter, and what we see is a very, very steady ramp uh, moving up, right? So we think that that similar situation is gonna is gonna happen in the U.S. It isn't always a, the smoothest glide path, mm. so there are gonna be bumps along the way. But when we look at EV adoption in the U.S., uh, take California as an example. One in four new vehicles sold in the state of California last month was a, was a battery electric vehicle. One in four? One in four, 25%. Does that include hybrids? No, that's pure EV. Pure, pure EV. That's pure battery. Wow. Yeah. So if we look at the forecasts for the industry, uh, many forecasts have 35% uh, of the new vehicle market being battery electric vehicle by 2035, I believe it is. If we hit that, that requires 30 million charging stations in the United States, which is a massive number. So whether it's whether we hit 35% or we hit 30% or 28%, it's still a huge number. Mm. So when we talk about concern over infrastructure, it's the number one reason why someone does not buy an electric vehicle. So it's incumbent upon Blink and upon uh, our industry competitors to be pushing that forward and to be installing charging stations literally every single day, and we are. So every day that goes by, there's another charging station in the ground that potentially is chipping away at that anxiety of not having a charger available. So how soon can I confidently say, all right, screw it, I'm going EV, I go to the lot, I pick up a vehicle, and I feel like I can do my road trip across the country without worries? Yeah. So I think it depends on everyone's personal situation. So as an example, uh, in my household, we have two vehicles. One of them is a Tesla, and the other one is an internal combustion engine vehicle. Okay. We have a charging station installed in our garage, and we never have an issue uh, doing our living our daily lives in our local community, right? So if you think about the amount of time that you spend going to work, uh, going to the mall, going shopping for groceries, right? That's the vast majority of what we do. Then every once in a while, we'll jump in the car and we'll do a road trip, right? So for us, uh, at the moment, everything we do in our local community, we use, we use the Tesla. Then when we go on longer distance trips, depending on the routes and where chargers are located, we may take the Tesla or we may opt for the internal combustion engine. Now at some point, when the infrastructure is kind of fully built out, we won't take the internal combustion engine vehicle. So it really depends on your access to charging. If you're in an apartment building, you may or may not have a charging station there. Sure. We're working very, very hard to get chargers, again, predominantly where somebody lives, right? Because that's the that's kind of the beachhead, right. right? You need to have a charger where you live in order to be able to facilitate that. So. I love that, and you brought up an interesting question. I heard a story, my auntie has a neighbor who installed a charger by the street or something. She said he came out one day and someone was using his charger, and he said, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, what do you mean, what am I doing? I'm helping save the planet. And he's like, no, you're charging me money. You know, there's <laughs> actually some interesting companies that are in the industry that are emerging that will actually, through software, 
let um, let folks, let public uh, have public access to their home charger and actually charge a fee for it. Wow. So there's some really innovative business models, even allowing private residences to allow others to use their the charger, let's say, in their garage. And it charges up pretty quick overnight, like I can charge my vehicle, no worries? You know, they're, one of the great statistics in the automotive industry that most people don't know is that the vehicle sits idle 90% of the time. So think about it. Go out, we buy these, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollar vehicles, yeah. and they typically sit idle 90% of the time. Now, the most obvious one is overnight. So when I plug in in the evening, 100% of the time, my vehicle's fully charged in the morning. I don't care that it takes three hours or four hours or five hours. I'm asleep yeah. while that's yeah. happening. Uh, so then, you know, I can also access charging out in the community. So what we're really moving towards is, hey, I'm at a restaurant. I'm spending, you know, an hour and a half, two hours there. Uh, I'm at the movies. I'm at the mall. And this is where level two charging stations like this one right next to me will serve that purpose because they're much, much less expensive to install. They're much, much quicker to install uh, at a, you know, so at a fraction of the cost of a DC fast charger. So, you know, this is really what Blink's bread and butter is, is we lead... Uh, with level two charging, AC charging. I love that. And by the way, dual use, a lot of people still don't realize, you know, we saw the video digital out of home advertising at the gas station, right? At the pump. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge opportunity with uh, even the Volta Charging Network. We did a feature where there's huge ad revenue. And a lot of the people that are nervous about, well, transitioning my gas station that I've owned for 20 years towards this digital, I'm worried. There's tons of revenue to be made. Have you guys looked into the DOOH side of this as well? Uh, yes, we have, as a matter of fact. So, in fact, I can't say who it is, but we're about to actually install our first uh, project in, I believe it is uh, Utah. Nice. In fact, it's Utah, uh, utilizing uh, a partnership that we have uh, with Level 2 Charging Stations, uh, digital signage. It's really going to be quite cool. And as editor of Digital Signage Today, I'll be following that closely, so let me know when that launches. <laughs> yeah. Now, before we dive into the actual hardcore tech, I'm curious about a meta question, and it's been referenced in some sessions. Uh, the sustainability question, right? So, lithium batteries, uh, we just saw a report from, I think, the World Economic Forum that it's getting harder and harder to get the resources and then distribute the resources, rare earth metals, lithium, etc. Uh, people are looking into sand batteries. They're looking into the beetle shells. Weirdly enough, in Australia, there's research going on. How sustainable are EVs really? Because I've been talking to people about my excitement. They say, oh, pff, that's not sustainable. You're still using lithium batteries. Mm -hmm. You're still using an unstable electrical grid that uses fossil fuels. How do you respond to those critics and naysayers? Yeah, so I have a pretty simple answer to this. Uh, there's no such thing as a utopia. There's no perfect technology. It doesn't exist in any, in any market, in, in anywhere. So what I always come back to is when I'm driving down the street, and I can smell tailpipe emissions from the car in front of me, mm -hmm. and I know that I'm driving a battery electric vehicle that it's not emitting anything, to me, that's the anecdotal evidence, right? So it doesn't take me a lot of convincing to, right. you know, we can talk about, you know, supply chain and where the, you know, where the minerals come from and how much power does it take to actually produce an EV, but there's so much research, or I'll maybe even use that loosely, there's a lot, mm -hmm. of, um, a lot of anecdotal stuff out there. Uh, there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> conjecture. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, I would be hard pressed for somebody to show me that a battery electric vehicle pollutes more than an internal combustion engine. And I think it doesn't pass the sanity test. And you know what's incredible is battery, there's no question battery technology is going to change, mm -hmm. right? There is so much investment going into just that. Forget about infrastructure, just battery yeah. technology yeah. that you're going to see. You're going to see improvements, leaps and bounds. There's going to be, as you mentioned, uh, multiple uh, uh, ways to kind of skin the cat, uh, and and they're going to be very application specific too. You know, you're going to probably have batteries for uh, l uh, light commercial vehicles that are different from uh, heavy duty Mac, you know, uh, 18 wheeler trucks, and you know. So this again, we always say we're at the very beginning of this evolution of automotive technology. So you're part of building the future of humanity in a very real, real way, not to be cheesy. I hope so. You know, we, we, we do like to say that we're, we're, we're kind of changing the world one charger at a time, right? So every time a charger goes in, uh, it makes it much more likely that somebody's gonna buy a BEV. It affects things like clean air and, you know, the list goes on and on. What makes your chargers unique? Yeah, so this is my favorite product that we, that we actually have in our lineup. So this is the Blink Series 7. It is what's called an AC level two dual port charging station. And so this enables uh, two vehicles to be charged at the same time. It's relatively inexpensive. 
it is easy to install, and it is quick to install. So as an example, this is the exact charger that the United States Postal Service selected uh, for Blink as, as one of their primary suppliers. So it was the largest contract in the company's history. Uh, so we often say, hey, look, if the United States Post Office put yeah. the stamp of approval on this, you know, that, that, that's a pretty good credibility. So this is the charger that we are deploying out into public spaces. So with municipalities, with shopping centers, again, like I mentioned, workplaces, um, hospitality is a really big one, hotels. So really? As, oh, absolutely. So as people start to rent EVs or as people travel from point A to point B in an electric vehicle, they're starting to choose the hotel that they stay at based on the availability of a charging station at that hotel. So this is exactly the type of unit uh, that you would see. Now, there's, you, you said the wireless access, right? So what this enables you to do is actually activate the charger a number of different ways. So I can uh, activate it through my mobile app, the Blink mobile app. I can activate it with an RFID card. And in some of the models of this or variations of this, I can actually pay for a charging session simply by tapping my credit card. We just saw this huge feature, uh, certain well-known charging networks that look very good, and then users get there and they're, they're busted, they're not working, they're yep. working slowly. What is the Blink network maybe a little more reliable as I pull up to charge at my hotel or what have you? So that is my favorite question. So I, as I mentioned up front, I'm the chief operating officer of the company, and my boss, who's the CEO, reminds me almost on a daily basis that I am responsible for charger uptime along with my team, right? So first of all, it's the number one priority of Blink. The number one priority of Blink is to make sure that our chargers are up working and that when somebody rolls up to a charging station, it's available for them to use. So we do that uh, through a number of different ways. One of the very new features of the Blink network, which we're incredibly excited about, is what's called proactive monitoring. So we have more than 20,000 charging stations that are network connected in the United States. So now what the platform does is it proactively pings us and says, hey, this charging station is down. Now there's a number of different ways that we can resolve that. We can actually just do a remote reset. So these things are computers. So think about your laptop, right? When your laptop starts to get buggy or starts to get kind of funky, the first thing we all do is reboot it, right? That's exactly what we do. We can do that from our network operations center remotely. The customer on site doesn't even have to touch it. Wow. Uh, the second thing that we do is similar to a laptop is you shut it off and then you shut it back and then you turn it back on again. And we can do the same thing on site. So we can simply do an electrical panel breaker flip and that typically resolves the vast majority of the issues. And then if we need to, what we do is we roll a technician out to the site and we don't fix the charging station in the field. What we do is we have them take a brand new unit with them. They simply pop the unit off the pedestal or off the wall and then they install a brand new station. Hot swapping. It's hot swapping. And then from a sustainability perspective, what we do is we take this station and we bring it back to our facility in Tempe, Arizona, and we refurbish it. And because we own and operate thousands of charging stations coast to coast ourselves as Blink, we will actually redeploy it out to another site. So we throw away very little is the point. I love that. And yeah. one of the big concerns, I mean, there's so much happening with climate change. Uh, the Texas grid famously uh, died during the horrible winter storms. Uh, Europe is going through a lot of issues with a frankly an aging and unstable grid. Yeah. You've got young innovators passionate trying to say we need a smart grid with systems redundancy, we need more photovoltaic. Power grids are becoming a very big issue, especially because we had 8 billion humans, which I can't believe, yeah. last year. Yeah. Yeah. You so can't control weird. power grids globally. I don't think uh -huh. you're yet in that space. Yeah. Uh, how do you approach that? Yeah. So first of all, uh, number one, and, and this is really important, every ounce of electricity that gets produced in the United States is produced domestically. So as we, as we evolve with the battery electric vehicle industry, as we install infrastructure, we are less reliant on foreign oil. So that's number one. So again, if we could, and by the way, the United States doesn't have an electricity production problem. In many areas, what it has is a distribution problem, and that is the real kicker. If we could export electricity to other countries, if there was a viable way to do that, we have plenty of electricity to do that. Mm. So it's, a, it's an important distinction. So secondly, uh, what you're seeing is incredible innovation around, like you mentioned, microgrids. And there's a number of different ways that, that, that those get executed. It's things like battery backup storage systems that are not grid 
tied connected. They can be grid tied connected or they're not. And when they are grid tied connected, it recharges the battery. And then at times when either the grid's down or where peak demand is happening and there's a lot of draw on the, uh, uh, on the grid, the battery takes over and can dispense electricity. And by the way, can we say surge pricing can be greatly reduced, I hear, because of this? There's, yes, it can. Yep. And by the way, the Blink Network allows you to set pricing based on different times of day in order to accommodate things like demand. That's amazing. Now, yep. does the Blink actually store power as well in case of emergency? Ah, so the unit itself does not, but is compatible with battery backup storage. Nice. So you're going to see things like innovation in microgrids. You're going to see more and more battery storage being deployed, deployed at the same time that you're going to see the utilities upgrading the infrastructure. Right. So all of these things are coming around, uh, and and they'll happen kind of simultaneously. And you know, what is what's Warren Buffett say? Don't bet against America. Is that his, <laughs> is that his, is that his thing? So I think it is. Uh, so you know. I think this is just another example of the innovation that's going to happen. There's a need. Everybody talks about it where there's a need and there's money to be made. Guess what? Industry figures out a way to do it. I love that in the EV sector, I meet so many passionate people like yourself who, it also, it feels like you're doing something you care about more than earning a living. Maybe this is just me, but as I talk to people, I see them light up and talk about, hey, we're helping the planet. Is that part of your company culture and what, what makes you personally so passionate about this issue? Wow, that's a, that's a load of questions, a good one. Um, so let me start with, I'll start with me personally, and I'll talk about kind of the way I think it extends out to our organization. So for me, I grew up in the automotive industry. My entire background uh, for the last, call it 30 years, has been in auto. And uh, as I, you know, kind of about three or four years, about four years ago, uh, as I was meeting with automotive clients across the country, and almost every one of them, by the way, the only thing they wanted to talk about was the transition to battery electric. Wow. And I started to see that this thing was actually incredibly viable. And the automakers, all 100% of them had plans to bring new products to market, right? And, and many of them, like Volkswagen and others, were literally going to transform their entire product lines to battery electric. Wow. So for me, I said, wow, I have an opportunity to stay very, very connected to the automotive industry to be, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, working in it at its core mm -hmm. in a totally new technology that is environmentally beneficial. And I won't even talk about where my politics are. It's a material, sure, sure. right? And so there's no defined uh, person left, yeah. right, center that cares about this stuff. Because at Blink, when you look at our employee base, it's very, very diverse. But everybody, all the oars are pulling in the same direction, which is we know that we're doing good when a charger goes into the ground and it enables another battery electric vehicle to be sold. Well, you know what's incredible, you know, what's amazing about this is it's actually unfortunate that the politics has kind of gotten involved in it, right? Because right. the technology is great. If yeah. you have never driven an electric vehicle, find an electric vehicle to drive because when you hit that accelerator, mm -hmm. the smile it will put on your face, you, you, you'll actually start laughing. So when we first start, when we first got our Tesla and we drove it off the lot and we hit the accelerator in sport mode, we literally were sitting in the car laughing wow. because of how fast it was. Now, I won't say how fast. I won't wow. say if I was speeding or not. You know, we'll leave that out of it. But, you know, it's just great technology. Um, the, the convenience of being able to refuel the vehicle uh, in my garage if I have access to that, right? And you don't yes. have to go to a filling station. You don't have to go to the gas station, yeah. right? And, you know, it, there, there's just a lot of benefits to it that are, that are great. And, by the way, it doesn't mean that you have to go 100% electric with every single vehicle, right? It means that there is a time and a place and an application for a battery electric vehicle. There's a time and a place and an application for an internal combustion engine vehicle. And you know what? The market is going to dictate which technology is the preferred technology and it's going to move towards those. And there'll be many mod uh, modalities of technology mm -hmm. out there. There's mm -hmm. going to be hydrogen. There's going to be electric. There's going to be internal combustion, right? It's not going to be just, you know, one ring to dominate them all. Or right. Oh, I love that. I love that. The rings <laughs> I, don't know. Yeah. I still need to watch the new one on Amazon Prime. <laughs> But t tell me, I'm glad you mentioned that. You're anticipating my question. You're a wizard. Burn him. No, I'm kidding. Um, what is the future? And I'm not going to hold you to this in 10 years. Some people say internal combustion engines are just going to be gone forever. Some people say, oh, EV, psh, that's not going to work. We, yep. need, we need something else. I literally was talking to someone who is an Isaac Asimov fan. This is a throwback to science fiction folks in the audience. Uh, who said, no, it's going to be a form of cold fusion. We just saw an announcement about cold fusion recently where they actually had it in the lab, unlike in the 90s. Yeah, and yeah. in 80, 60 to 80 years... We've been talking about cold fusion for since I was a kid. <laughs> the Department of Energy, I'm excited. They said within 60 to 80 years we will have a meaningful reactor. But I'm like, I don't want to wait that long. So 
my question to you is this. Yep. What is the future? Consumer vehicles, we've got semis, you name it, transportation. What is the future? Is it going to be hybrid? So, unfortunately, I'm uh, 53 years old and I'm old enough to have seen many different things in the technology space uh, kind of come and go, whether it's the dot-com bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's always that term, right, a rational exuberance, mm -hmm. right? And so mm -hmm. what winds up happening in any of these situations is that people are excited about something. You know, there's tons and tons of press. There's all kinds of investment that happens. Um, and sometimes things get over-indexed. Sometimes they don't. Uh, then, p then the pendulum swings, mm -hmm. right? But what winds up happening is the market finds its equilibrium. And so when we talk about what's gonna happen in five years, 10 years, do I think battery electric vehicles are gonna be a very significant part of that? There is just no question in my mind mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Again, whether it is, is, is it 40%, is it 60%, is it 80%, you know, who knows, right? But again, the market dictates. I would say that what is going to dictate it more than anything is the pace of technology improvement. Mm -hmm. Right, so technology improvement on the vehicle side and also on the availability and the technology improvement and reliability on the infrastructure side. And if we can make progress on both of those things meaningful, then guess what? Individuals, corporations, uh, fleets across the board, government, non-government, they'll choose BEV, right? Just because it's a better, it's a, it's a better technology mm -hmm. and eventually it's gonna come to par price parity uh, with internal combustion, and it's all we're already starting to get pretty close. I think it's happening faster than people are realizing. Yeah, it is. It is. Now, it's, it is. I see so many booths about wireless power, and I'm curious: Are we going to see a future where we don't even need to hook up? Uh, potentially. Uh, again, you know, I think there's always going to be a role for uh, connected charging stations, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, but will because they'll, they'll kind of probably always be faster. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, well, it's just like Wi Fi. Wi Fi is always yeah. slower than your Ethernet. Cord. Exactly, yeah. it's a great analogy, as a matter of fact. So, is there going to be, again, similar? Is there going to be applications for uh, wireless charging? No question. And Whitricity is over there, and, they, and they're uh, demonstrating uh, their technology, and it's pretty cool. Uh, but, and you know, we're looking at things like that. Uh, the market's not quite there yet for, uh, for wireless, mm -hmm. but again, there'll be room for both. So what can we expect to see as we're watching you guys in the next year or so? Uh, what, what headlines can we watch for from Blink? Like new yeah. innovations, expansion, you yeah. name it. Yeah, so first of all, uh, there's a technology out there called plug and charge. So for those of you that own a Tesla, uh, you're familiar with this experience. You pull up to a Tesla supercharger, you plug it in, and the car and the charger authenticate, it charges my account, and I just, I, I don't have to wave a credit card, I don't have to do anything. Wow. So that same technology is coming to uh, kind of the rest of the world, if you will. So by the end of 2024, we're going to have plug and charge enabled. Uh, but keep in mind that there's two things that have to happen with plug and charge. The vehicle itself needs to be engineered with it. And then the charger also needs to have the right hardware and software in order to enable that. But we will have that live in 2024. Uh, secondly, uh, we are moving towards, you know, you, you've heard of vehicle to grid, right? So the same type of hardware and software implementation for plug and charge actually extends the vehicle to grid. So what, the way we see it is number one, plug and charge is gonna get enabled. And then as the market develops and as we continue to uh, advance on our, on, on our software implementation, we'll move towards vehicle to grid. And that's things like, hey, I can power my home from, my, from the battery on my car if, if wow. the power goes out. Or wow. I can push electricity from the battery in my car to the grid and get paid for it potentially wow. from the utility company, right? So those are all of those things. Then uh, secondly, we will also be looking at introducing our own uh, silicon carbide-based DC fast charger. So we announced that previously. Uh, our development team is moving quickly uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, launch that. And so we anticipate that we will have a working prototype here in the next couple of months. And then by the end of 2024, be in production. And why is silicon carbide such a big deal? Because it is more reliable. Okay. So it's not as prone to things like temperature, uh, and is also more reliable. So that's the direction that that Blink is moving is to silicon carbide based DC faster. I love that. And as we close down, I've only got two questions left because you did an excellent job. You anticipated most of them before I could ask them. Uh, in terms of safety and security, uh, I think was it a Tom Clancy novel where it was an EMP bomb in Washington D.C. or something, and electricity <laughs> went out. Uh, and I have friends who are paranoid. They literally will tell me, "No, I just I don't trust it. I want an actual engine." Uh, is 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 it safe? Is is EV safe for that? Like you know, what? it's weird. It's actually ironic that you asked me that question. So, first of all, I actually posted an article on LinkedIn this morning that was um, releasing research on the incidence rate of fires 
in an internal combustion engine vehicle versus a battery electric vehicle. And the battery electric vehicle incidence rate of a fire is a fraction, and I mean a meaningful fraction of what the rates are right now for internal really? combustion engines. Yes, so you know we see stuff in the press about Tesla's on fire and all that kind of stuff, right? Does it happen? Yeah, but guess what? It happens a lot more for internal combustion engine vehicles too, right? In fact, yeah. more. So that's number one. Number two, um, <laughs> EMPs. So one of the things, you know, if, if let, let, let's 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 talk about <laughs> it, all right? So an EMP gets dropped, right? And the electricity grid goes down. Uh, if we have battery, if we have battery backup, mm -hmm. we'll still be able to use that charging station, right? I but keep that. in mind that if an EMP goes off, gas pumps don't work either. Okay, so let's you know again, it's all about you know, it's not conjecture, it's not you know anecdotal stuff. It's what are the facts, right? And those are the facts. Uncle Steve with the Bud Light, he's always negative about everything, right? But you got to go with the facts. I love you gotta that. Go with the facts. Well, it's Steelers Tours. We're in our last 60 seconds, last minute. I want to hand you the mic. Is there anything you want to say to consumers, to the industry? We do a lot of B2B as well. What's your big message for 2024? Yeah, have confidence. If you're considering an electric vehicle, uh, if you're on the fence, have confidence that you are going to be able to charge. Because as I mentioned, we are installing chargers every single day, coast to coast. The network is growing at an incredibly robust rate. You know, this isn't a financial kind of discussion, but it, it, here's a case in point. Our third quarter of 2023, our revenue was up 152% year over year, right? So, you know, wow. we we had a record year for Blink. We, we anticipate that 2024 will surpass 2023. So this is happening. Uh, the second thing that I would mention is we're not perfect, we know, right? There are uh, uptime issues, there are broken charger issues as you brought up, Daniel. But again, it's our number one priority and I have a great team of people that is strong working extremely hard, in fact, probably too hard uh, for their own personal good, uh, <laughs> which, you know, you got to tell them to back off every once in a while on really solving this problem and making sure that, you know, charges are up and running on a consistent basis. Uh, and then finally, you know, check us out, you know, um, it, it doesn't cost anything to become a Blink member. You can literally sign up on our website, uh, have the, the Blink mobile app on your phone, and then have access to, uh, you know, to thousands and thousands of charging stations nationwide.